architecture is the most practical and most dangerous of the arts. All the other arts we have to live with. They are things we have to live with, and some have even said, uh, as regards some kinds of music and painting, that they are things they could live without. But architecture is not a thing only that we have to live with, it is a thing we have to live in. We live with it as Jonah lived with the whale. Jonah could not see the monster, and there is a great deal to be said uh, for living in the most hideous house you can see in the landscape, as that is the one place where you will be unable to see it. I have before me uh, two or three very interesting books dealing with architecture. The first impression made by all these books is that architecture is at this moment in a very queer condition, much queerer than at any other period. We all know this, in a way, about what may be called practical architecture, especially domestic architecture. Now, in the past, there have been broadly two main social systems, slavery and a rough peasant equality. Most men's houses or huts or what not have either been made by themselves because they had uh, timber or clay or what was needed, or they have been made by their masters for them. The Eskimo made his own house of snow, and the Irish peasant generally made his own cabin of mud or peat, which was the real root of his sense of the injustice of landlordism. On the other hand, Uncle Tom's cabin was presumably built for Uncle Tom, and most English cottages were built by squares and testify to their traditionalism, their carelessness, and their natural instinct for the picturesque. But with the growth of modern towns and the reign of specialists, a very strange situation has arisen. For most people, the houses exist before the householders. Those rows of new villas in the suburbs are built for anybody, that is, nobody. William Morris, thinking of rabbit hatches, called the men hatches. But they really wait more like men traps. They wait for the men who shall come, or not, as the case may be. Only in the case of the wealthy, the householder exists before the house. The rich man has to kick his heels in hotels and horrid places, while an architect is building his house. Now, the speculative builders do not know what people would really like. So they build all the houses exactly the same, in a style that nobody could like very much, so as to be fair all round. In the second case, the millionaire can, of course, tell the architect what sort of house he would like. The architect listens sympathetically and then goes away and designs something totally different which the millionaire is obliged to accept because he is afraid of people suggesting that he knows nothing about art, which is indeed the case. In both these cases, you will note, a specialist does exactly what he likes. There is nothing to show that suburban people really like suburban villas. Indeed, I strongly suspect that most of the satire against suburban villas is written in suburban villas. There is nothing to show that Mr. Mag, who made his money in pork, likes the aerial perspective of a new architectural style of steel and glass. And he, poor devil, is a more miserable captive than the other, for he cannot write in the papers abusing the ugliness of his own house. And the suburban clerk can. 
Now all this is to say what most of these books largely agree in saying, that there is not any modern style that is popular in the sense that most people like to look at it, let alone that most people would naturally try to build it. A very sensible and well-balanced little book called How to Look at Building, Buildings by Darcy Bradle, Matthew in Six Shillings, makes this point all the more pointedly because it is not in any sense a controversial book. It does not profess to go so deep, for example, as another and larger volume called Purpose and Admiration by Jane Barton, Christopher, Ten and Six, of which I shall speak in a moment. But the smaller handbook makes this point very clear, for example, by a comparison with the 18th century. The 18th century was ruled throughout by the classical style. And as we shall see when we come to consider the Pugin and Ruskin, many held rightly that this classicism was narrow and cold. But even its narrowness was broad in the sense that it was as broad as the whole people. As Mr. Bradall writes, in the 18th century all were agreed that as far as they were concerned, classic architecture was vastly superior with what, to what seemed to them the rude barbarities of Tudor and Jacobean, arch Jacobean architecture. Today we have none of that. Today, that is, we have things that a few people admire, and we have things that a lot of people put up with. But we have not anything that can be called the taste of the age, which in the 18th century would make a banker and a bankrupt and a crossing sweeper, and even a poor wretched artist or architect agree that the old Bank of England was a suitable and elegant erection. Lord Crewe, ladies and gentlemen, you will be very naturally puzzled by my occupying any space, let alone so much space, in this uh, somewhat crowded but very distinguished assembly. And you will naturally ask why any words of mine need be added uh, to the uh, distinguished and beautiful words of that great veteran genius of literature uh, whom we have the honor of having with us today. Especially as I have no kind of claim to deal with the things with which he has dealt. I uh, do not know the dominions as he knows them. I have traveled uh, here and there in the miserable character of one giving lectures, <laughs> but not otherwise. Mm, and uh, uh, I have no special uh, reason uh, for claiming uh, to express a hospitality towards Canadians which would be expressed by every person in the street outside as enthusiastically as by me. Uh, for, let me say then quite briefly that my reason for accepting this invitation and for being here today is quite simply a desire to return hospitality. I remember that I was received by this great Canadian literary society when I uh, first appeared in the great American city where I first lectured uh, with a hospitality for which I shall never be able to give a sufficient thanks. And I think we shall all agree that whatever controversies or arguments rage about uh, the character of what used to be called colonial life, at least the ancient human traditional virtue of hospitality uh, is there 
flamboyant and magnificent in a degree almost unknown in our more fatigued society. All I know was that the Canadian Literary Society rushed out, as it were, full of hospitality, wanting to welcome anybody uh, from England, any stray traveller, in the confusion of the moment, I was mistaken for a literary man <laughs> and, dragged, uh, and, and, and dragged in to partake uh, of that uh, glorious camaraderie. Uh, the, I didn't know what to do. I thought of trying to explain that I was a lecturer. But I wouldn't do, because some of them had been to my lecture. <laughs> uh, uh, <then> I, <laughs> Then I thought, uh, could I say I was a journalist? But I was quite sure that would not go down. Uh, God forbid that I should commit so ghastly an error uh, as for doing what I well know to be the one unpardonable sin of confusing for a single moment the two great commonwealths that occupy the northern continent of America. Uh, but uh, I, think, I think it is uh, true to say that the ideal uh, of a press man, that the strenuous virtue required of a journalist, is somewhat similar in Canada and in the United States. A press man means a very different sort of person from me. <laughs> One glance at me would show that I had never crashed through a skylight in order to interview a celebrity, <laughs> that I had not slid through a door that was almost shut in my face <laughs> by somebody who wanted to keep me out of his bedroom, that uh, I had never performed any of those things that are the glory of journalism in the great world beyond the sea. Uh, therefore, uh, I was, as I say, in despair, and I had to pretend to be a literary man uh, for the rest of that occasion. And I grieve that it is necessary to continue that pretense, uh, uh, even for this brief luncheon hour. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the first necessities of the pretense, of course, is to talk about things you do not understand. Mm. One of which is Canada, <laughs> so far as I am concerned. But may I say this, in addition to having experienced what uh, no, nobody, uh, not a dog or cat and hardly a vegetable, could fail to appreciate, uh, the magnificent cordiality and courtesy of the Canadians considered as hosts. Uh, I had also seen, brief as was my visit, something else, and that was Canada. I've been twice in Canada, once about 12 years ago, when I merely crossed the border from America. It was in the earlier days of Prohibition. <laughs> it gives me a peculiar sense of gratification that though I, who have said almost as much in abuse of the British Empire or British uh, government as Mr. Kipling has said in praise of them, uh, it is, I am still, I am glad to say enough of an Englishman to say that it gives me a glow of pride to think that twice in the same hundred years men have escaped from the American Republic to Canada to find freedom. <laughs> <laughs> I was not exactly like the poor black people who ran or swam across the river or whatever they did in Uncle Tom's cabin. <laughs> Many could point out differences between us. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, the principle was still the same, but it is certainly true that in both cases, 
uh, had been maintained under the English flag, the tradition of freedom. Uh, there is another thing, however, that I should like to say, which concerns my second visit. The first time, as I say, I merely escaped like an ordinary a fugitive slave or runaway nigger uh, across the border. And I didn't know very much about Canada, because you don't know much about Canada if you merely go into it at that end. Every nation has a back door and a front door. Uh, and uh, with Canada, the front door is the back door. Uh, the last time I went, I sailed up the St. Lawrence. Yeah. That most magnificent and glorious of all entries to any civilization or any domain. A thing that truly opens a new world. And then I knew that the Canadians had the foundations of all literature and culture in them because they had truly and indeed a country. Uh, I'm not going to describe that country. That is your business. You are Canadian literary men. Uh, but uh, you saw at once that there was uh, that kind of vast natural background which is necessary to the growth of literary creation. And the other thing which I think is needed for all literature and is perhaps uh, the key to the difficulty that some have found about the literature of the new countries. I do not say myself at all that it is a real difficulty, a far less an insuperable difficulty, but it is a difficulty that many critics would raise, I think, who understand such problems. At the back of all literature there must be legend. A thing must grow out of something, uh, probably entirely false in the sense of mythical, not entirely false, but largely false. For instance, I should say that the story of the Mayflower, as commonly told, is almost entirely false. <laughs> but it is a legend. It lives. It has done things. And anybody sailing up the St. Lawrence uh, will <coughs> see where the legend of Canada begins that she is behind all literature. And I cannot tell you, least of all in this brief uh, and inadequate speech, what my feelings were when I mounted to those heights of Abraham where the great battle was fought and where I was, I will not say pleased for those words are foolish, I was uplifted in the worthy sense in which great poetry or great music or even great mathematics or philosophy uplift a man by finding that upon that crest they had set up a monument in noble Latin in the original con uh, international language of Christian men which commemorated together the names of James Wolfe and of Moncant <laughs> and I remembered that that great French gentleman who died in arms and that bourgeois boy of genius the most generous and full of the most genial fighting spirit of the, all the heroes of England alone to be named with Nelson uh, he whose statue still stands swinging a saber somewhat awkwardly in the, his statue in the little town of Westerham where he was born. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That those two great heroes are celebrated together in the universal language of Europe upon the height that is called the height of Abraham, upon the battlefield. That is what I call a legend and that should be the beginning of literature. I have great pleasure in seconding this to it. The president is the Canadian Authors Association, coming to the name of Dr. Dyson. <laughs>
But when I should resist the suggestion that we must eat beef without mustard, I do recognize that there is now a more subtle danger that men may want to eat mustard without beef. I mean that they may lose their appetite, their appetite for beef and bread and cheese, and depend entirely on spices and condiments. I myself have even been blamed for defending the spices of life against what was called the simple life. I have been blamed for making myself a champion of beer and skittles. Fortunately, if I was a champion of skittles, there was never any danger of my being a champion at skittles. Uh, somehow I never could aim at skittles with that precision with which I could aim at beer. But I have played ordinary games like skittles always badly, but all healthy people will agree that you never enjoy a game till you enjoy being beaten at the game. I have even played golf in Scotland before Arthur Balfour brought it to England, and it became a fashion and then a religion. My difficulty since has been that I cannot manage to regard a game as a religion. The horrid secret of my failure is that I never could quite see the difference between the cricket and golf, as I played them when I was a boy, uh, and the puss in the corner uh, and honey pots, uh, as I played them when I was a child. Perhaps those nursery games are now forgotten. Anyhow, I will not reveal what good games they were, uh, lest they should become fashionable. If once they are taken seriously, in that most serious world, the world of sport, enormous results will follow. Gamages will sell a special shape slipper for Hump the Slipper, or a caddy will follow the player with a bag full of 15 different slippers. Money pots will be made out of honey pots, and there will be a corner in Puss in the Corner. Anyhow, I have enjoyed, like everybody else, these sports and spices of life. But I am convinced that neither in your special spices nor in mine, neither in honey pots nor quart pots, neither in mustard nor music nor any other distraction from life, is the secret we are all seeking, the secret of enjoying life. All our world will end in despair unless there is some way of making the mind itself the ordinary thoughts we have at ordinary times more happy than they seem to be just now to judge by most modern novels and poems. You have got to be happy in those quiet moments when you remember that you are alive 